foreign policy really matters. And uh, it's elemental to this show. Yes, I will be throwing to that. And it matters because, first of all, look, there's a whole wide world. And it is an interdependent world. That word has been so abused. Um, there's a sort of superficial fantasy world of globalization interdependence. There's actually Buddhist and Asian systems uh, and indigenous systems of describing interdependence that are quite powerful. There's a Marxist understanding of interdependence, linking um, different supplies and chains of production, trade, commodities, uh, military strategy, empire, um, and all of the other facets of the world system. In the United States, you get to at least play a nominal role in defining how the U.S. empire behaves. And this is important because it affects every single inch of life on Earth. This is important because the problems that are generated by globalization, by military policy, by uh, interventionism, by basing, um, first of all, oppress brutally much of the world, and secondly, also loop back here. You cannot separate um, migration patterns from coups, from ecological crisis. As always, I expect people to be able to think through several things at once. We need to 100% abolish ICE, conform to international law on refugees. In the United States, there is absolutely zero problem at the border. And the only reason we aren't letting people in is because of racism, xenophobia, and fear-mongering. Fear -mongering. However, if we want to create a systems analysis of this, we need to understand things like the coup in Honduras, like our military basing, like our interventionism in the Middle East, like our acceleration of the climate crisis, and then all these other areas that we continuously destabilize. You know, Kashmir is an incredible, dangerous part of the world right now, accelerated by the Indian government that we won't hold accountable. Uh, we haven't thought about how to innovate foreign policy and diplomacy in such a way that we could actually confront China on its treatment of the Uyghurs in a way that, of course, has nothing to do with military or jingoism, but recognizes that, again, we are interdependent and we don't want that kind of systems abuse of anybody. Our role in Afghanistan and Pakistan helps destabilize the South Asian continent. So I say this all as a preamble, and they might even be two separate clips, to say again, that this stuff really matters and not just for people who are curious or people who, you know, want to study it in college and, you know, God forbid, either kind of neocon monsters who want to fulfill their own lack of substance um, and, 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 you know, and virility by playing stratego with the world. And certainly, my God, please not neoliberals who want to have nothing to do with solving systemic crises in this country, but want to go do um, a moral wish fulfillment in Africa, as an example. There's a lot of problems of a lot of archetypes that are drawn to international affairs, but it matters. And it also matters quite practically in a presidential election because out of the gate, presidential candidates, presidents have the most power over foreign policy, period. No single person denies that on day one, there is power over a massive foreign policy apparatus. There is another apparatus of things that you can do on domestic policy for sure. And then there is the argument about how you implement a change agenda. Do you bring a movement to it? Do you create systems change? Do you try to confront the whole system because we're at such a crisis point? That's the Bernie Sanders argument. Or do you somehow try to triangulate an argument between a sort of progressive push within the parameters of discredited systems and institutions, the Warren argument? And we can go back and forth on those arguments. I think one has a lot more evidence behind it, but it is all speculative. Foreign policy is not speculative. Drones are under your control. The National Security Council is advising you. You have immediate power over military action, over trade, over how the intelligence services are organized. And in fact, actually another way of looking at it is that you do have an enormous amount of control, but you actually go up against the undemocratic bureaucracy that engines foreign policy. That after a post -cold, uh, particularly post-World War II world, there is this entire infrastructure that frankly 
If it hadn't turned into a goofy conspiracy theory term, an alt-right term, you could call it a deep state. There is a self-licking ice cream comb of systems, the intelligence services, private military and intelligence contractors, um, the Pentagon and others that control an enormous amount of resource and fuel the foreign policy that follows the logic of empire in very specific ways. It is an engine of US capital interests overseas. It is an engine of aggression and of keeping the world conforming to the US Anglo dominated system. That's it. And a president for both ethical reasons and also because of the fact that the world is changing radically are we going to have a power system shift between the United States and China that doesn't lead to crisis is a fundamental question. Are we going to have a power system shift that allows us to have a shift with China while still, as an example, talking about the Uyghurs, the occupation of Tibet? And by the way, allowing China, China releases reports sometimes on our race record. Good. As they should. That's the world we're entering. We need a plan for it. Bernie Sanders is bringing people like Matt Dust to the table who are really thinking about these things. They're saying, let's have a global Green New Deal where we partner with Russia and China. Let's have a green technology transfer to countries that are historically oppressed and in the periphery. Let's globalize a fight to fight the broader ecological crisis. Let's really look at how a global oligarchy works and how that relates to our trade policies, which are written by corporations across the globe. Let's finally cut the defense budget. These things are non-negotiable. And I want uh, to put that in place while I get to a questionnaire that was recently at, um, delivered to the Council on Foreign Relations by Elizabeth Warren. This again, and I am part of the frustration is I can hear people in the back of my head with these, you know, all of the kind of generalized complaints about uh, criticizing Warren, but I really want you to listen to this. This stuff actually matters. So I won't give another preamble, but it really matters. I'm going to focus on a couple of specific areas here. This is question two. What would you do to rejoin the 2015 Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action, the JPOA? Uh, what changes to the entire agreement, if any, would you require, would you require before re agreeing to rejoin the accord? Now, again, this is the Iran nuclear deal. That Iran followed to the T, the Trump administration in, in the smacking everybody in the face, including the U.S. lackeys like the United Kingdom. The only people who are on board with this are the Saudis and the Israelis destroyed this deal while implementing a new sanctions regime, which is literally designed to murder average Iranians, block them from getting cancer medications, block them from buying safe jets for their domestic air fleets. So I recognize the limits on domestic American politics. Nobody's gonna put it as strongly as I put it while they run for president. But you would say, this deal is an enormously important deal. It's a fulcrum of international security, then trash the Trump administration for being reckless, dangerous, stupid, egotistical, neocon, and grotesque for putting the whole world in danger, which these Trump thugs have done by destroying the Iran deal. And then, by the way, if you're Bernie Sanders, you can say, I was the only member of the Senate and the Democratic caucus to vote against Iran sanctions in 2017, which helped accelerate the Trump administration's approach. Warren can't say that because she voted the wrong and dangerous way on that bill, just as she voted the wrong and dangerous way to make John Bennett Brennan the CIA director. But listen to how she answers this question. If Iran returns to compliance with its obligations under the nuclear deal, the United States should return as well. If Iran is not in compliance, I will pursue a strong and principled diplomacy in concert with our allies to bring both the United States and Iran back into the deal. The JCPOA is only the beginning. We will need to negotiate a follow-up on that agreement that continues to constrain Iran's nuclear program past the sunset of some of its original terms. We also need to address serious concerns about Iran's policy beyond its nuclear program, including its ballistic missile program support for destabilizing regional proxies. The JCPOA made addressing these problems easier by taking the threat of nuclear armed Iran off of the table. And then she goes on to repeat some correct things about Trump, but you know, sure, whatever. 
this is a stunning way to frame this issue. If Iran returns to compliance, Iran stepped out of compliance with this deal after the Trump administration had torn the deal up, threatened Iran, moved aggressively in sanctions and military action, have threatened military action against Iran on a regular basis. The Iranians finally took a few small steps to enrich beyond the deal, clearly by every indication as simply a signal that you can't endlessly bully us. Now, she could have answered that question in a way that at the very least, clearly and definitively, pin the blame on the Trump administration. It's both politically effective and true. <laughs> then she goes on to talk about these other things. And I will remind everybody, first of all, Iran within the context of the historical accords on nonproliferation is within its rights to a rich uranium. This is already highly unusual globally to even have an agreement like this. The original arms control was this idea of atoms for peace. We're going to accept that there's five countries in the world that have nukes. If everybody else signs the nuclear nonproliferation treaty, you can use nuclear energy. So already we're accepting that Iran is outside of the bounds, even as there has never been definitive proof that Iran is pursuing a weapons program. And I think clearly they've actually pursued a policy of strategic ambiguity. There's rhetorical signals they've sent in the past that maybe they would. They certainly, re they totally dismantled the Shah's program after the Iranian revolution and restarted elements of it after the, during the Iran-Iraq war when Saddam Hussein was literally using chemical weapons on Iran and every single member, permanent member of the UN Security Council was selling weapons to Iraq. So there's a reason why there's Iranian paranoia here. So at the same time, no intelligence estimates from any reputable intelligence agency, if you even want to take them seriously, has ever definitively established an Iranian nuclear program for weapons purposes, and their head, their leadership consistently denies it. Obviously, I wouldn't take it at face value. I'd take nobody at face value. But to be very clear, it's reported in the U.S. press that this is analogous to North Korea or Pakistan or something. It's not. Absolutely not. So... She totally misframes it. Then she brings in these poison pill secondary issues, which were originally brought up to kill the Iran deal in 2015. Oh, we can't have a deal because of Hezbollah, because of ballistic missiles. Now, the reality is, is that the JCPOA, actually, if you wanted to set up the path for the United States to, first of all, get the hell out of the Middle East militarily, which Matt thus has said the Sanders administration wants to do, which is first and foremost vital and hugely important. It doesn't mean there isn't diplomatic, commercial, and all sorts of engagement. But it says we can't keep dominating that region militarily, and we can't keep racing and harming uh, human lives and resources in that way. So that's number one. And then number two, the Saudi-Israeli axis needs to be changed. It doesn't mean that we like Iran. It doesn't mean we agree with everything that Iran does. But frankly, even these so-called proxy groups that she says are destabilizing, they're not from a U.S. perspective. They have nothing to do with U.S. security interests unless you accept a slavish devotion to Saudi Arabia and Israel, which no modern foreign policy maker should. And this isn't even left-wing stuff. This is a very realist calculation. So it's disturbing just the repetition of all of the cliches and brain dead thinking here. Then it goes on and she has a section on North Korea, which is we need a serious realistic negotiations to address the threat. As a first step in coordination with partners and allies, I'd be prepared to consider a partial limited sanctions relief in return for a strong, verifiable agreement that keeps North Korea from expanding its arsenal or proliferating from other countries. That might be okay-ish. That would return us back to maybe even something like what's happening in the Clinton era. But clearly, there's no real strategy there. And look, I was never somebody who buy it. I Look, is Trump's fixation on the North Korean leader bizarre? Yes. Is his fixation on dictators generally unhealthy and weird? Yes. Was nothing, uh, has nothing really been accomplished between the United States and North Korea? Absolutely. However, 
the Democratic – Bernie Sanders is the only one so far that I'm aware of to say, of course Trump should have met with him. Are you crazy? I mean, this is something you don't have to overthink. The fact of these two egomaniacs meeting each other and having a direct line and Trump thinking he has a personal bond with him has absolutely reduced the likelihood of a catastrophe. And the South Koreans have wanted this under moderate leadership. When is somebody going to say, and again, baby steps, but when is somebody going to say, look, North Korea is an obscene regime. They have a disgusting domestic human rights record. They do all sorts of horrible things. Incidentally, they have a justifiable worry because they're surrounded by a ring of U.S. military presence. They're under constant threat themselves. And like any other regime, they have a rational survival instinct, regardless of what we think of the ethics of any of these regimes. And we also just need to recognize, like, they have nukes. It happened. <laughs> They've got it. So what's the next plan that's real? That isn't a cliche to contain this situation. And incidentally, what lesson do you keep sending the rest of the world? The United States supports a coup in Brazil through the last several years because of because you know Dilma announces basically that she uh, we have these new oil deposits that are discovered. They're going to go through a state oil company and fund education into perpetuity. You can look it up several years ago. And then that starts to correlate with you with the Edward Snowden revelations, huge aggressive spying on Dilma, but also Petrobras as a company. And then the DOJ backs this Lava Jato travesty. So it all connects. I mean, look, I mean, look, even look at look at Gaddafi. Another obscenity of a leader right there. But let me tell you something. That guy said he chose, oh, I'm back in the world system. Let me get rid of my nukes. And then Sarkozy was like, I think I want to get rid of the evidence of your campaign contributions to me, allegedly. And we were only all too happy to go along with it. There's deals to be made. It could probably be even easier to suck up Libya's resources. Now Libya literally has open air slave markets again. Okay. And that destabilization has spread into Mali and across the whole region. Very no, you know, totally conventional stuff on Ukraine. I've made it a point a million times. Russia has its own imperial influence. I don't, you know, I'm not a justifier of Russia, but I also do not want to have a ultra hawkish policy there uh, at all, which threatens the globe. Um, she makes some good signals on Afghanistan, although... You know, to me, it's so vague and still speaks of so many sort of economic and other forms of assistance that it doesn't seem to me like the type of plan that can really end the self-licking ice cream cone that is that occupation, which is still killing an enormous amount of civilians, which she does not mention once. And also nothing about what even Trump was willing to do, of course, before he wrecked it. But it's like, yeah, you need to negotiate with the Taliban. You need to. That's the only way it's going to happen. Um, she says she wants to encourage a political settlement between the uh, Afghan government and the Taliban that's sustainable and protects U.S. interests. Um, so, again, uh, potentially some good signals there. And I, excuse me, I, I realize I misstated in the first. She does acknowledge the importance of negotiating a political settlement with the Taliban. I don't know if she means a direct U.S. role in it or facilitating between them and the Afghan government. Nothing on civilian casualties. Briefly, when she talks about Saudi Arabia, she says the Saudi-led war in Yemen exacerbates instability and extremism in the region and has resulted in the deaths of thousands of civilians. So, you know, this is the nitpick portion, but I would say a lot more. It's caused significant more death than that, including things like cholera outbreaks and hunger. And every time Bernie Sanders talks about his work on Yemen, he talks about it being one of the great murder fields in the world today, and that it's abomination what we support in Saudi Arabia. And I just think it's very revealing, the lack of engagement on that. I'm sorry. Here's something uh, that is very disturbing. Now, there's one candidate who said that they will consider suspending USA to Israel. Bernie Sanders. Pete Buttigieg has made a, uh, something if, if they formally annex the West Bank, okay? <laughs> Bernie Sanders has actually said as a tool of diplomacy, we will potentially consider that to hold Israel accountable. This is uh, 
on Israel. Do you support a two-state solution to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict? If so, what would you go about to achieve it? Now, of course, even the question is pablum and, you know, how a two-state is even logistically possible, setting that aside. Notice how Warren, who was an aggressive supporter of the Israeli bombardment on Gaza in 2014, and didn't flinch when presented with evidence of Israel bombing schools and hospitals and has said steadily, you know, that she will not take any actual action to hold Israel to account in this. Look at, but this is the quintessential of her campaign. Check out the wokeness of the language now. I believe in the worth and value of every Israeli and every Palestinian. Okay, well, that sounds great. So far, so good. What's the material upshot of that? The way we respect all parties is through a two-state solution, an outcome that's good for U.S. interests, good for Israeli security, its future, and good for Palestinian aspirations for dignity and self-determination. To achieve this, there must be an end to the Israeli occupation and the creation of an independent and sovereign Palestinian state in the West Bank and Gaza Strip, living alongside Israel. As president, I would immediately take immediate steps to reestablish America's role as a credible mediator, welcoming the Palestinian general delegation back to Washington and reopening an American mission to the Palestinians in Jerusalem. She also said she's not even talking about anything about the um, even the shifting the U.S. embassy out of Jerusalem, as an example. And then she goes on to make a couple of um, things that are necessary, but were bipartisan consensus until Trump, like supporting the UNRWA mission, things like that. I will oppose incitement to violence and support for terrorism by Palestinian extremists like Hamas, and I will make clear my unequivocal opposition to Israeli settlement activity and to any moves in the direction of annexation of the West Bank. Well, first of all, if you won't put aid on the table, you don't mean anything. That's the bottom line. If she said, I will, threat, I will suspend aid to Israel day one because settlements have never stopped. And then the other part with Hamas, look, how was peace achieved in Northern Ireland? You have to deal with every power, you have to deal with every faction here. So the pablum and the repetition about Hamas is just pablum. There's not gonna be any change here. And if you combine that with her previous relentless support and during the campaign, you know, Bernie posed with the end the occupation now activists. Those signals matter. And you combine that with the demented answer on Iran, blaming Iran for that, we're in really big trouble here. Then we go to Venezuela. Maduro's a dictator and a crook who has wrecked his country's economy, dismantled its, its democratic institutions, and profited while his people suffer. The United States should lead the international community in addressing Venezuela's humanitarian crisis and supporting regional efforts to negotiate a political transition, including free and fair elections as soon as possible. So then why has she not supported AMLO? Why has she not supported the Norway process? Why has she not said very clearly that obviously the U.S. propping of Guaido is illegitimate? Now, again, these are outside the realm of what most U.S. politicians are going to say, including Sanders. But the reality is, if you're going to use that rhetoric, there are multiple diplomatic processes happening now, and they're happening from the periphery, whether it's in the Caribbean or in Northern Europe. She hasn't supported any of that. And in fact, you know, people didn't like Bernie's phrasing several months ago, but he did at the end of the day oppose the escalation uh, in Venezuela several months ago. She did not. And when you talk about other regional players, who exactly are we talking about here? Brazil and Colombia as far right clients of the United States? Then she said, we must also pressure China, Russia, and Cuba to become constructive players in the crisis. And if they refuse, we must contain their damaging and destabilizing actions. Well, okay, same. <laughs> yeah. You know, I mean, like, even worse <laughs> in that situation, too. We're quite literally destabilizing the entire country by. We are. Yeah, I mean, we're radically destabilizing. The, yeah. Yes, we recognized an illegitimate government and have been trying to wage coups in Venezuela going back to 2002. So there Cuba. is what? But it's Cuba. But it's Cuba, so it's bad. And again, these are the types of answers. The point is, is that, you know, because I saw some people say, well, what's wrong with this? What's wrong with it is that it's all conventional pablum. And if you go into the White House with conventional pablum, 
going up against the strongest institutional interest, there will be no change in foreign policy. And that means, and you'll see a repetition of the people like Samantha Power and all these people who've presided over all of these democratic catastrophes. And what that will mean is, along with her voting record, a continued skyrocketing military budget, a completely unchecked Israeli apartheid, no redeeming of the Iran deal, and that is an optimistic area, and the ongoing subjugation of Latin America and the Caribbean, which is economically horrifying, militarily horrifying, and again, continues to generate the conditions uh, that lead to things like um, migration at rates that are not people choosing to go where they want to go, but literally needing to flee for their lives, which we should all oppose. Seems pretty obvious. And mostly what she's talked about is trade, which I think it's great that she opposes these corporate trade deals, but she always talks about it from the perspective of the American worker and American business interests, which is interesting because, you know, we're just not in that world anymore. We are in a globalized economy. So the question is, is how are we going to have a globalized, abundant economy that works for all, not some imagined middle class past that we cannot recreate? And then I just want to say, I just want to note this because... You know, one of the things we try to do on the show when we talk to someone like Milton Alamadi and cover certain stories is take Africa seriously. And if you look at, you know, especially in this, this sort of like weird liberal mindset, there's, you know, OK, we have double standards. Obviously, you know, it's OK to be kind of racist towards Palestinians, although that language will get much more woke now without any follow through. Um you know, Asia is, you know, that's an area where we can kind of get in. And certainly Russia, we can engage in our xenophobia and competitive instincts. The Europeans, uh, we kind of admire and want to emulate. I'm talking about the liberal mindset here. Uh, but they're subordinate to us. Latin America and the Caribbean, um, there's actually a lot of contempt for uh, in that relationship. Although we need to sort of signal some respect because of domestic constituencies at home. And then Africa, even as we continue in a post-colonial mode to compete with China and France in a, just a, an ongoing post-colonial relationship with Africa through exploitive trade deals, through an expansion of things like AFRICOM and military presence there. But in the mind, you know, there's still this notion of Africa as, oh, well, let's, hang, let's help out Mother Africa. Let's, oh, 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 poor Africa. Those are the undeserving poor. Not a vitally important continent, which is fast growing, which is obviously the victim of huge historic crimes, which has dynamism, challenges, has produced extraordinary leaders across the continent, produced extraordinary crimes across the continent, has a complicated dynamic process, which, you know, encompasses unbelievable geographic linguistic diversity. So this is a little, this is the type of thing that the Warren people won't like because they'll say it's petty, blah, blah, blah. But I'm sorry it matters that this is the kind of, you know, 1990s model UN stuff. By 2050, Africa will account for 25% of the world's population according to projections by the United Nations. What are the implications of this demographic shift for the United States and how should we adjust our policies to anticipate them? Africa is made up of diverse countries. I wish I could have like some type of UN speech under this or some type of like, oh, we can't because of those schmucks, but like almost like a West Wing. What would work with this? I'm trying to think. Probably not Mission Impossible. All right. Africa is made up of a diverse countries with differing objectives and needs, and it makes little sense to think of them with a singular policy. My administration will treat the region as a priority rather than an afterthought. Requires this, re achieving this requires fresh, innovative diplomacy that prioritizes engagement with civil society as much as with governments, and we should seize an opportunity to promote transparent government and more equitable, inclusive growth that supports a vibrant middle class, including through efforts to tackle wealth concentration, kleptocracy, and corruption. I don't know how that fits with this idea of being a point person for U.S. business interests and competitive advantage. Because if you look at the capital drain out of Africa, yes, there's problems in local governance. But the amount of foreign direct investment and the amount of capital that is still sucked up by the core out of Africa is still stunning. And I have to say, I mean, look, as far as contrast goes, you go back to 1988 and Bernie Sanders 
is sitting at some forum in Burlington telling you how World Bank IMF structural adjustment programs work and how they impose austerity to pay off Western banks and then open up unregulated areas for Western exploitation and business. I mean, again, this is just another area. I'll just end on this. You have, you don't have the choice in this election between obviously we're just going to promote AFRICOM and drones and greater military partnerships and maybe kick in a little bit more for foreign aid to Africa versus, you know, Donald Trump's racism and complete lack of understanding of the continent or some like neoconservative Christian something or other. You have an option of somebody who has historically understood the role in the center in exploiting the periphery. That's, what is that? Is that oh, from the streets? Yeah, someone has a really loud bass. That's incredible. <laughs> so anyways, uh, you guys want to weigh in on this? I, look, foreign policy really matters. They have power over this day one. Get serious. I just, I just want to add about specifically the Africa question at the end. That if you're very serious about, um, you know, aiding and helping out the continent, taking very seriously the amount of extraction that American companies specifically are um, conducting in Africa, why don't you talk very seriously about American corporations pulling profits out of Africa that are generated in Africa and bringing them back into the United States? And also add that the second part of the uh, answer to that question is also very worrying. Um, because it's all focused on population growth. You know what? Yeah. That's and really important. This is really, you're you absolutely right. You about paternalistic right. way of talking about it, an entire continent of people. I mean, it gets into some of the more dangerous uh, tropes about Africa. You know, I'm all in favor of, you know, trying to do as much work as we can to make sure that women have access to whatever health care choices that they want to make. But when you start talking about population growth um, as rapid uh, population yeah. growth in Africa is the potential to exacerbate environmental and social stressors and have been seen to produce mass youth unemployment, impacting security and regional economies beyond the continent. Now, I have to say, Bernie Sanders got this very weird Malthusian question at a forum and he, as he understood the question, just pivoted to, I support women's right to choose. This is an actual echoing of that kind of talking point. And again, as David says, of course, family planning, reproductive justice is a global goal and essential in a variety for just a variety of metrics. But the notion that you are going to frame the problems in rising, like she, she just talked about environmental stressors. We just told you the environmental stressors. It's rare earth minerals. It's the complete destruction of a place like a Congo because of Western corporate interests. Your phone is fueling tremendous violence and ecological instability. And so the notion that we get into this Bill Gates mindset of, well, you know, God, we got to worry about the population growth of Malawi. No, we got to worry about slashing global emissions emitting from the center of the economy. That's how you deal with it. Not weird minding and paternalism about other people's populations. And so if you're reading this the right way and you're reading it critically and you're thinking about foreign policy, all indications here of a return to the destructive past. And I and you know when it comes to certain domestic areas, even the worst democrat is going to, you know, cut home heating oil less than a Republican. And in that tiny margin is a lot of lives. And that's why I've always recommended strategic voting. In foreign policy, uh, that gap is even smaller. And if you think we can go back to a conventional foreign policy, either from a strategic standpoint of our relationship to China and the changing global dynamic, or you think it is appropriate to continue to have a completely colonial relationship to Caribbean and Latin America, uh, we're just doing fundamentally different things politically. If uh, I just wanted to add one more thing on the yeah. Africa question too. Yeah. If you're serious about the ideals that she sort of presents at the beginning of her question and you don't talk about debt, that's right? right. I mean, you're really, you. she says that she doesn't want to treat Africa as an after, afterthought. If you're not talking about debt, Africa is an afterthought, in, in my opinion. I agree with you 100%. You just watched a Michael Brooks show video. Subscribe to get them all. Why wouldn't you? Don't be foolish. Click subscribe below and become a patron as well. Patreon.com slash TMBS. Thanks, everybody.